Hello, I'm Leslie Bennett with the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. It is my pleasure to host this special series of interviews with individuals who are recognized for their innovations and contributions to the pharmaceutical sciences. Speaking on behalf of AAPS, one of our goals is to develop a series of videotapes in which we invite eminent pharmaceutical scientists to discuss their points of view on the events, issues, and challenges that have shaped the direction of the pharmaceutical sciences. We will also explore their perspectives on where the pharmaceutical sciences are headed in the future. Today, it is our pleasure to have the opportunity to visit with Dr. William J. Jusco, professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo. Bill, it's very nice of you to share this time with us today. Thank you, Les. I'm really pleased to be here. So let's start off. I think that there is no doubt that you are recognized as one of the most eminent scientists in the area of developed of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and their correlation. And I think it would be worthwhile for our listeners to understand the impetus for this, where it started, and what drove you into that field. Okay. Uh, my early career was one of uh, serendipity. Uh, I worked in a pharmacy when I was in high school and continued in college, worked in hospital pharmacy. But I went to school at the University at Buffalo, and Gary Levy, who's the grandfather of PKPD, uh, was one of my teachers. Uh, he was very nice to invite me to work in his lab part-time when I was a pharmacy student. So I did some early studies with salicylate absorption, uh, riboflavin absorption, and found that I enjoyed research a great deal. Uh, he encouraged me to uh, not continue as a hospital pharmacist, but to go to graduate school, which I did. I stayed at Buffalo, and my research dealt with the pharmacokinetics of riboflavin. After that, I joined the clinical pharmacology unit at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Boston. At that time, I became interested in cancer chemotherapy, and my interests broadened from basic pharmacokinetics to the, the pharmacodynamics of things happening as well. So I had some early publications on the theory that underlied the ways that drugs kill cells and the overall profiles of, of uh, cell killing in, in various aspects by drugs. So this sparked my interest in, in PKPD, and I kind of looked at the pharmacodynamics on and off until the late 1980s. At that time, my interest blossomed considerably, and we began a, a series of studies and theoretical papers that uh, created what we call indirect response models and transit compartment models and target-mediated drug disposition models that have now provided the underpinnings of much of what is done in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. That's great, Bill. Thank you. Um, I wonder, I don't know if you know this, but let me, let me tell you, you are, there's something called an H factor, where you look at how many publications and how often they've been cited. And in fact, you are the highest H factor of any pharmaceutical scientist uh, that is in this association. Wow. Uh, and I think it's really imperative to show how important the work that you've been doing in PKPD has translated over to people citing your work related to those kinds of interactions. So congratulations to you and keep up the good work. Well, that's nice to know. <laughs> so where do you think, I, I, let's talk about in the last few years, the FDA has really jumped on to this PKPD and, P and modeling. And it'd be interesting in your perspective of how they now have adopted the field. I think some of it's because your students are there. Uh, and where you think it's going and what's the aspect that will turn into a regulatory aspect of this work you've been initiating. Okay. Uh, I believe the FDA's uh, interest in, in, in PKPD pharmacometrics probably began uh, when Carl Peck was there, and then since then Larry Lesko has strongly embraced it. And one of my former postdocs, Joga Guburo, is now the uh, head person in pharmacometrics. Uh, the FDA has grown this area considerably. I was just there last week and, and really 
was impressed with uh, what they're interested in and how they see it going for the future. I strongly embrace the white paper that was produced by the FDA a couple of years ago that pointed to the need for improved biomarkers and then the use of PKPD modeling and phar pharmacometrics to interpret such data and to be used as a way of accelerating drug development. Well, I think all of this is going to continue. Uh, it's been shown uh, by people from Pfizer and by others that use of modeling can accelerate drug development. It can save a great deal of, of money spent for very expensive clinical trials. And basically, it, it helps considerably because it provides a foundation upon which to do the studies and interpret the studies. So PKPD and pharmacometrics is basically a way of thinking and thinking logically about how drugs work and how data should be interpreted. So it's, it's uh, quite reasonable that it be used as it, as it is. So you, you can tell by looking at me that pharmacokinetics is an old field. Uh, but people like you have really invigorated it and kept it going, and I think it'd be worthwhile discussing your perspective of a young person coming into the field today and what the future holds for them and what the opportunities are. Well, uh, Les, you're not that much older than I am. <laughs> I've always thought of you as a benevolent uncle, but I think you're only a couple of years older than I am. Uh, uh, the whole pharma, pharma, the, the field of pharmacy, pharmaceutical research, uh, PKPD and pharmacometrics is a great field for a young person to get into. Uh, pharmacy is wonderful because it embraces so many different scientific fields, statistics, mathematics. It just takes the best of, of everything that's relevant in research and directs it towards better drugs or safer drugs. Uh, I have no doubt that for any young person, this would be a wonderful field to, to get into. Uh, I have three older daughters and two younger daughters, and uh, my 12-year-old daughter is, is committed to being a biomedical scientist and pharmaceutical scientist because she sees how much I enjoy what I'm doing and, and thinks it's a great thing for her to do in the future. That's neat. But what about the others? They're not going to be pharmaceutical. That, that's a great thing. You know, I have, a, I have a grandson who's interested in pharmaceutical sciences, so I envy you because you have a child who's interested in pharmaceutical sciences because it is a, a, a wonderful field. Do you, let's talk a little bit about because the concentration at Buffalo. I mean, there's no doubt that the concentration of pharmacokinetics, pharmacometrics people at Buffalo and the emphasis there has been very important in the development. And could you give us some perspective on that? And sure. Yeah. Uh, this uh, past summer, uh, our Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences celebrated its, its uh, 50th anniversary. Uh, the department was established by Gary Levy. And Gary Levy was a, was a magnificent force in, in uh, evolving the area of, of biopharmaceutics, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. Uh, after, as Le when Levy was a younger faculty member, uh, Milo Gibaldi joined our department. And Milo Gibaldi became an, an eminent teacher and author of, of the earliest and primary book in pharmacokinetics. Uh, Others came, uh, I left and then returned back to Buffalo, and, and then we gained other faculty with interest in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So it's, it's always very helpful for there to be sort of a, a, a group of people who can interact. Uh, gain, we gain efficiencies in teaching. Uh, we can create the best of courses and research programs for our graduate students. And then funding agencies look to a place like us for uh, you know, supporting our research and the companies and other universities look to our graduates. So it's kind of snowballed since uh, the time that Gary Levy uh, was, was active in our department. So for our listeners, uh, in this series, uh, Dr. Gerhard Levy, State University of New York, was one of the first interviewees. 
and that tape is available uh, within the series of AAPS eminent scientists. So that's great. There's no doubt, Bill, that he has had a really important uh, contribution to many areas of the pharmaceutical sciences. Let's talk a little bit about, yes, this is a very attractive field at this time, and we see it. But today, in the graduate program, you very seldom see pharmacists going into the graduate program anymore, at least at California we don't. And so what we have to do is compete with sort of the genomics, uh, biologics, uh, stem cell work. How do you think we do in that? And where is the, are, are we going to be challenged in terms of bringing students into this field, uh, even though it has such great promise as you brought out? There's a bit of challenge. Uh, uh, we have a white coat ceremony every summer to admit our class of pharmacy students. And I usually sit there in awe at, at the incredible uh, talent that comes in, into our school as, as pharmacists. And, and uh, we graduate 120 pharmacists every year. But unfortunately, perhaps there's only one or two that, uh, that are interested in, in pharmaceutical research. And, but join a program like, like ours or yours. Uh, it, is, it is a challenge. We do get uh, a great number of applicants for our graduate program, and we, we, we are creating very, quite a few very talented researchers. I wish more were pharmacists, and I wish there was something that could be done to encourage more of, of our pharmacy graduates to, to join our graduate research programs. Part of it's uh, the financial situation. Uh, a graduating pharmacist can earn, well, $120,000 a year, whereas we pay a stipend of 25000 And we'd like to pay more, but there's a great limitation in, in uh, sources of funding and stipends available. So that's a little bit of a detriment, but probably not the major one. Uh, we just have to work harder in attracting students to what will be an exciting and, and uh, very rewarding career. Okay, let's, let's switch topics a little bit. And I, what I'd like, you're, you have been in your career very influential in the pharmaceutical industry. You've consulted for a number of companies and been involved in their development. Uh, I, I think it'd be worthwhile talking about your perspective, the advantages to you in terms of what you gain from these interactions as well as what you think you bring to the field by having the opportunity to do this. Okay. Uh, our, when when we have people completing our PhD program, most actually go into the pharmaceutical industry and, and quite a few go to the FDA and a smaller fraction go into academia. But I encourage you know, the, the, the more talented ones to pursue academia in part because of the fabulous rewards that, that exist for, for an academician. It, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to, to work with young students and, and to teach. It's great to be able to have an idea and be able to pursue, do the basic research, to, to pursue the idea and, and to reach fruition on, on the types of research projects that we can, we can uh, seek. At the same time, we have opportunities to interact with the other arenas of pharmaceutical sciences. Uh, I've been a consultant for the FDA and, and, and see what's happening there. I've consulted uh, and continue to do frequently with pharmaceutical companies. So in a way, being an academician, you, you're not, you don't miss out on, on, on seeing what happens in the pharmaceutical industry, and you have a chance to influence the, the projects that are being done and help the scientists there. And then lastly, once in a while, we get called to be a, a scientific expert, an expert witness for law firms. And that's kind of fun, too. It's a little different perspective on drugs, and, and you get to see the legal aspects of uh, what results in profitability or lack of profitability for the companies. So it's such a diverse and rich career that it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I definitely agree. Let's, let's talk about in today's economy problems with the, what happens with the budget at the state level and at the federal level. Uh, a number of schools are having difficulties in being able to fund their research programs or their graduate programs. And uh, I think you have been quite successful at uh, Buffalo in shielding that, your students from that. 
And uh, I think it's important to understand, maybe from your perspective, why you've been so successful. Well, it's, it's a continuing struggle and it takes an effort to, to obtain the support for our faculty and our, our graduate students. So uh, we energetically seek uh, support from the NIH and the uh, amount of funding available has been uh, limited and it's very difficult to get NIH grants. We've been successful, but not as successful as we would like. It, we would like more support. And I understand in the future the funding is going to get even tighter. Uh, we depend on uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And with 50 years of graduates, uh, we get quite a bit of support coming back from our alumni who are able to appreciate uh, what we provided to them. And in turn, they, they convince their, the companies to, to make, make some donations. And it's also important for organizations like the APS uh, and the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy to provide the support that they do for students. They should be doing more of that because we, we need this kind of support for our students. So there's a limitation on numbers of students that we can graduate. And by keeping alert for different sources of funding, uh, maintaining contacts with alumni, we're, we're able to get along, but we could be doing better. I, I, I believe each year you hold this uh, seminar where all your former graduates come back. Is that a yearly thing or is that? Uh... No, it's about every four years. Okay, every four years. In, yeah. in this past summer, we had what we call the Buffalo Pharmaceutical Symposium where our alumni come back for a three-day meeting. Okay, and so let's, let's talk about that. I think that's something good to, for everyone to hear about because uh, I, I attended one, even though I'm not a Buffalo alumnus. I was attending one of them. I think yeah. I spoke at it. So, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this uh, symposium is not simply for our students and alumni, although it, it's partly that way. We open it up to others as well. And what we also do is we invite a number of prominent guest speakers. So that's, of course, why, why you were invited. Uh, we try to make the, 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 the symposium attractive uh, as in terms of its total science. So, so we, we select several areas, four areas that... Uh, the, 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 we, the speaker's uh, address. Uh, so we make it a meeting that would, in essence, compete with any national meeting in the areas that we present. One other thing I thought is worthwhile, especially here, we're at the AAPS meeting in New Orleans, uh, to talk about the importance of your students and postdocs attending meetings like the AAPS meeting. Yeah. Uh, we, we had a reception on Monday evening. Uh, we, we typically do this every year at the APS meeting. And it's important that we hold it on a Monday evening because that allows every, all of our alumni and students to know when they could, we can all get together and to make the initial contact if we can't find each other and, and uh, to, to, to make these connections again. So one of the great things about AAPS is the chance to see old friends, alumni, to, uh, to uh, follow up on connections made earlier, appointments and such. Uh, it's, it's a great venue for just interacting uh, besides listening to the science and enjoying the festivities. So thank you very much, Bill. I think this has been a very instructive and very nice summary of the outstanding career and the contributions that you have made and something that be very useful for young pharmaceutical scientists as well as elderly pharmaceutical scientists like me to re-listen to this talk. So thanks again, Bill, for sharing your time with us today. Thank you for having me, Les. I enjoyed this.